begin our multi-part look at the Bible. But before we do that, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening as, as we do every time we come before you in humility and in thankfulness for who you are and what you've done. And one of the, we, have, we have countless things. We'll have all eternity and we still won't have enough time to thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. But one of the things that we are specifically grateful for tonight is your word. And uh, I pray that you would help us. You tell us in James that if any of us lack wisdom in your word to ask for it, you will give it freely. And so that's what we ask for. Please help us to have wisdom of your word, to, to gain a greater wisdom and understanding of your word. And not only that, not just being hearers of your word or readers of your word, but help us to be doers of your word also, so that our lives are marked by your word, that every thought, every deed, every word is measured by us through your word, that we live our lives according to your word, for your word is the lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So we pray that you would help us through the wonderful presence of your Holy Spirit, the one who breathed out your word. Be with us, bless our time in your word, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible. How you view the Bible will dictate how you deal with the Bible. If you really believe the Bible then it will mean that you will view it and handle it a certain way, right? If you don't really think the Bible is the word of God, it will show. And if you really believe with every fiber of your being that the Bible is the word of God, it will also show. And unfortunately, in today's day, there is, uh, even though there's more access to the Bible, there's more access to God's word than ever before, uh, there is great doubt in God's word. Even pastors, even, um, even people who are apologetics, uh, they, who do apologetics, they have doubt in God's word. And it's sad. It's sad. You should be excited. I've told many of you the stories of how disappointed I was when, when God was opening up his word to me and how electrifying it was. And I just wanted to share in my excitement. And I would go to pastors and I would go to leaders and I would go to professors and none of them, had, they were all wet noodles. None of them were excited about God's word. And I could not understand why. But I understand better now. Uh, they didn't believe it was the true, inspired word of God. They didn't believe that it was inerrant. They didn't believe that it was all sufficient. They, they didn't believe in it. They might have believed in this or that. They might have cherry-picked a part here and a part there. But they truly, in their heart of hearts, did not believe that God's word was God's word. But like the reading tonight, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. He is the author. And there is one interpretation for Scripture, one proper interpretation, and that is the author's interpretation, what's called authorial intent. Whatever the author intended for something to mean is the true and only true meaning. And so God is the author of his word. It was breathed out by him. And so we look for his authorial intent in the Bible. And the Bible, we recognize, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in all righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. We recognize that God says this about his word, that in Psalm 119, that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path in this dark world. Jesus says in Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's Scripture. We live by Scripture. We find our way in this dark world via Scripture. We are taught, reproved, corrected, and trained up for righteousness through Scripture. And Scripture is truth. Jesus says in John 17, to sanctify them in truth, your word, he's speaking of God the Father, your word is truth. Of course God's word is truth. He is, the, he is the author of truth. He is the source of truth. 
So when you want to know between truth and falsehood, where should you go? God's word. You go to God and how has God revealed his truth through his word. And you need, and my hope would be that by the time we're done going through all this study, that, that you feel an even greater confidence. My, I, my prayer would be that you have confidence in God's word right here and now. But my prayer would be that at the end of all this, you feel an even greater confidence, an unshakable confidence in God's word. Not because you understand every jot and tittle in it, but because you know the one who breathed it out. And he is faithful. And he is powerful and able to keep his word. To that point, Matthew 24, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's word will always be. It will always be. Not just now. But for all eternity, his word will always be. Not many things you can say that about, but God's word always will. It will never pass away. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Forever. So studying God's word and having confidence in God's word is no idle pastime. You're going to get way more out of studying God's word because guess what? It will go with you into eternity. It will be forever. And another benefit of studying scripture, believing in scripture, and then therefore studying scripture will be that you will see yourself in a clearer light and you will see God in a clearer light. It will humble you and exalt God. And the better you understand who God is and all of his awesome attributes, the better you will worship him. The better you will worship him in song and thought and deed and in your everyday walk. Regardless of what you and I think, God's word will stand. Whatever, regardless of what you and I think, God's word is truth. Unchanging truth. The one who breathed it out knows all things. There was, there's no need for a revision in God's word because when he breathed it out, he already knew everything. There's no corrections necessary. Charles Wesley proposed this argument. He said, the Bible must be either the invention of good men or angels or bad men or devils or it's of God. So it's one of those three was his, was his argument. It could not be the invention of good men and angels because they neither would or could make a book and tell lies all the time they were writing it, saying, thus says the Lord, when it was their own invention. Follow me? Good men and angels couldn't have written the word of God because the whole time they would be lying, saying, thus says the Lord, or the Lord said this, or the Lord says that. They'd be lying the entire time. So it can't be the invention of good men or angels. It could not be the invention of bad men or devils, for they would not make a book that would command all duty, forbid all sin, and condemn their souls to hell to all eternity. Make sense? Bad men and devils wouldn't write such a book because why would they write such a book that condemns them, that encourages and commands duty, that forbids sin? They wouldn't write such a book. Therefore, It must be via the process of elimination. The third option, which is the Bible must have been given by divine intervention. It was written by and given by God. So as we go through our study on the Bible, we're going to cover a lot of different areas. And one of the areas we're going to cover is can you trust the Bible? Can you trust it? It's, It's an incredible book. There's no argument about that. It is the most uh, quoted, best-selling, most published, most circulated, most influential, most translated book in the history of mankind. And it's not even close. Far and away the world's bestseller. Back in 1932, this is back in 1932, 
It was computed that one billion copies of the Bible had been published. Back in the 1960s, it was estimated that over two billion were published. Right now, it's estimated to be around four billion copies published. Again, no other book is even close. Not even close. The Bible has been translated into well over a thousand languages, representing about 90% of the world's population. Throughout the centuries, many, many enemies have tried to destroy the Bible, yet here it stands. How many men have made it their life's mission to destroy God's word? And they're in the ground. And God were, God's word stands. Voltaire, the French philosopher and skeptic, predicted in the 18th century that the Bible and Christianity would soon be obsolete. In 1828, 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society was using his house and using a press within it to publish the Bible. Just, a, you know, just one of those things where God is kind of a little wink and a tip of the hat. What was that about the Bible and Christianity being dead? You cannot destroy. Man cannot destroy. Gather every man, gather every demon, and put all their power together into one moment, and that is still not enough power to stop God's word. Because God has ordained that his word shall always be, that nothing will ever stop it, that it will never fade, that it will always be forever and ever and ever. And because God has ordained that, and because God is all-powerful, that is exactly what's going to happen. And if he's powerful enough to ordain and to keep all of those things, to keep his word, certainly he's powerful enough to breathe out his word and keep that in an inerrant, all-sufficient way. Can we trust the Bible? Is the Bible really inspired? Is it really the inspired word of God? How can you know it's not just an ancient book of folklore like another book? Haven't the contents of the Bible been tampered with down through the centuries? Isn't it out of sync with scientific discoveries? What makes the Bible different from the Koran or the Book of Mormon? How did we get the Bible? What's the difference in all these translations? Those are all the different things that we'll be covering through this study. And I think those are good questions to ask. I don't, you, we don't need to be afraid of questions. You don't need to be afraid of those. Those are questions I used to ask. Asking questions isn't wrong. And there are answers to those questions. Just like some of the questions you guys asked in the open time this morning. There's answers to these questions. So you don't need to be afraid of them. Matter of fact, even if you don't know the answer, you still don't need to be afraid because trust in God. He's the one who breathed it out. You've got to know that he has got it all covered. Even if you don't understand it, all God does. So you've got to have trust and faith in him. And, 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 and you know what? That's what it comes down to in the end anyway. No matter how much information you get, no matter how many answers to how many questions you get, in the end, eventually, it will always come down to faith anyway. God has made it that way. So that no matter how much knowledge you gain, you'll still have to, in the end, come to him in faith. Because that is the way God has ordained it. God didn't just put his word out there so that you, could, you and I could go to it on occasion or that, you know what, um, I feel like drinking a coffee this morning and listening to some classical music. I'll put the Bible on the windowsill, open the window, and I'll see where the wind blows and I'll check out which passage God puts there. You know, God didn't give us the Bible as like some kind of secondary tool. This is, this is everything. He wants us and commands us to be well acquainted with his word. Not, not just, oh yeah, I've cracked one of those open once or twice. This is how God has revealed himself to us. If you really love someone and they wrote you a bunch of letters, would you leave the letters in the envelope? Or would you rip open every envelope and voraciously read them? Because you wanted to see what they had to say to you. You wanted to learn more about them because you love them. Well, that's what the Bible is. And so... God wants us to be well acquainted with his word. It's one of the evidences of a genuinely saved person is that they love God's word and they desire to be in God's word and to grow in God's word and to get answers to their questions in God's word and to have confidence in God's word. 
It's 1 Peter 3.15 that says, In your hearts, in the core of your being, who you are, in your heart, honor Christ as Lord. Honor Him as holy. And always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And you do it with gentleness and respect. That is, how do you do that? How do you know how to do that? God's word. God's word. Because of God's word, I know that Jesus is the Christ. Because of God's word, I know that he is Lord. Because of God's word, I know he is holy. And I know I'm not. Because of God's word, I know that I can have confidence and faith in him. And that is how I am able to then make a defense to anyone who asks me, why do you have hope? And I can tell them about Christ because of God's word. This is the word of God. This is not some machination of man. First, uh, Second Peter 1, verse 21. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. So no true prophecy. There's plenty of fake prophecy that's been produced by the will of man. But this is referring to true prophecy. No true word of God was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. That's how God authored his word. He carried his chosen ones along by the Holy Spirit, breathing out his word. We've already quoted 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But let me go just a little bit before that. And read verse 14 through 17. This is Paul talking to Timothy, a young pastor, okay, his spiritual child. He says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Do you know what the sacred writings are? Scripture. Scripture. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. How do you know how to be saved? How do you know? What's, how do you get wisdom for salvation? How do you know how to be saved? Scripture. These sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So it's not your knowledge that saves you. It's God's word that gives you wisdom that points to Jesus Christ, who is the one who saves you. It's your faith in him. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Sounds, even if, even if I didn't read any other scripture, sounds like scripture is pretty important. How do you get saved? You gotta, how do you, where do you learn how to get saved? Scripture. Scripture. How do you, who do you learn of in Scripture? God. Jesus. You also learn about yourself. Make no mistake, the hero of the story is Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. It's all about God. It's not about us. We're not the, we're not the main character in the story. Jesus is. God is. God is the main character from beginning to end. Through this series, I hope to show you and give you confidence that the Bible is indeed what it claims to be, the trustworthy, worth giving your life for word of God. Written by men, yes, but men who were guided by God, who were carried along by God's Holy Spirit. So, can we trust the Bible? Does the Bible claim to be uniquely inspired by God? Well, we've seen that already, haven't we? Just in 2 Timothy 3.16. That all Scripture is God-breathed. We see that there. We saw it in 2 Peter already in, verse, in chapter 1. All of you must understand that no prophecy came about by the prophet's own interpretation or man's will. Nope. It never had its origin from the will of man, but men spoke as they were carried along by God's Holy Spirit. And you say, well, I don't know about all that. I mean, that sounds kind of... Isn't that impossible? Uh, do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe in creation in six literal days? 
What are you going to tell me about what's impossible for God? Really? Sometimes we've got to just remind ourselves of what you already believe. <laughs> you already believe in a virgin birth. You already believe in, in God that created all things. You already believe in all that. You already believe that, that in salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. You already believe in the imputation of sin to Jesus Christ and his imputation of righteousness to you. You already believe in all that. And you're going to tell me this is too much to believe? Come on. Come on. The writers also claimed to be inspired. David said, The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord. Paul said, I give you these commandments by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are claiming to be inspired and being carried along by the Holy Spirit. They, God has told them what to say, and they are claiming that this is what God has said. They are claiming to be inspired by God. John, he says right at the beginning of Revelation, the very first verse, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ to his bondservant, John. Claims of inspiration. This isn't John saying, hey, how's it going, everybody? Hope you're well. Don't change this summer. Hey, by the way, here's some of my thoughts on the current state of the church. Nope. What does John say? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ has revealed these things to me, his bondservant, John. That is claiming to be inspired. Jesus himself claimed that the scriptures were inspired. Every time he said, we must do this to fulfill the scriptures, that is claiming inspiration. God directly revealed parts of scripture. And then these people, would, these men would write them down. So everything that God intended to say, he was making sure it was said. Now the writers, they use their own styles, and they express their thoughts through their own ways, right? Luke was a doctor, so he's going to write in a different way than Matthew, a tax collector, would. Paul was an educated man, he's going to write in a different way than someone who is less educated would, right? This is what happens. Yet, even though you have all these different writers from all these different backgrounds, the same Holy Spirit was carrying them along, which is how you get the uniformity and perfection in the Scripture. That's how you get it. God controlled the accuracy of everything that they wrote, and that is the, the miracle of the inspiration of Scripture. And you must trust that the God who holds the universe up with his breath by his word, that he is able to do this too. That this is nothing for him. It's nothing for him. What other evidence is there that the Bible is inspired by God? Well, how about supernatural change in people's lives? Isaiah 55, verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. This is the Lord speaking. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What's God saying about his word there? It has power. And it will do exactly what he sent it to do. And one of the things he sent his word to do is to create supernatural change in those whom he saves. The Bible causes a supernatural change in people's lives through its message of sin and repentance and salvation. A visit to any Bible-believing church will yield you plenty of examples. They're called testimonies. So when you share the gospel, the gospel and your testimony are not the same thing. When you share the gospel and someone believes it, and God, boom, in that moment of faith, God saves them and justifies them. And now they are adopted, they are justified, they have had their sins paid for on the cross. They are now a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. And then they're going to have a story to tell about who they used to be 
and what God has done in them, that's the testimony. That's not the gospel, that's the testimony. And the testimony attests to this supernatural change that comes about because of the word of God. That is one of the most powerful evidences of the genuineness of the claim that the Bible is the word of God. Look at the lives that have been changed. Look at how many people have given their lives for this book. Look at how many people have been changed by the truth contained in this book. Hebrews 4.12 reminds us that the word of God is living. It's alive. It is active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides. It pierces to the division of the soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This is no, that is no ordinary book. There is no other book that can make that claim. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. What other book does that? No other book does that. And discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No other book does that. It is supernatural in what it does to those people who read and believe it. It has a supernatural effect. Something's going on here, right? Even if you don't know a lot, you'd say, boy, I keep meeting all these people whose lives have been radically changed after they read and believed what the Bible said. Where there's smoke, there's fire. God's word is unique. Another way that we can look at the validity of God's word truly being, like the Bible really is God's word, is all the fulfilled prophecy. We talked about prophecy quite a bit when we did our study in Ezekiel. We did so when we did our study in Isaiah as well. That God is God, and only God can say, this is what I'm going to do many years from now. And he prophesies and he says, this is what I'm going to do. And he can claim it and he can be very specific and he can be, and he does all those things. And he is always 100% right because they are always fulfilled and they're always fulfilled. And he's always 100% right because guess what? He's the one who fulfills it. He doesn't just make a call and be like, hey, this is going to happen in the future. And then sit back on his throne in heaven and cross his fingers and toes and be like, boy, I really hope that so-and-so and such-and-such does this and that this other individual does that because if they don't, my word won't be fulfilled. No. God has the perfect record in his word that he does because he fulfills it. He fulfills his word. So every prophecy that he has said will be fulfilled. It's either has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. Here's some examples. We could be here all night if I gave you every one of them. But here's some. Israel's rebirth as a nation. After being dispersed many, many centuries ago, God predicted, ordained really, prophesied. In Isaiah 11, in Ezekiel 37, by the way, Ezekiel or Isaiah 11 was written around 750 B.C. Ezekiel 37 was written around 600 B.C. For almost 2,000 years since A.D. 70, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, the nation of Israel did not exist. God called and prophesied and said, One day I will bring my nation back. One day they will be reborn as a nation. For 2,000 years they did not exist as a nation. Then, in 1948, Israel became a nation. There's a fulfillment of of prophecy. God didn't, this isn't like a horoscope either. Oh, you'll, you, you'll have a difficult week. No, this was specific. This was specific. <clears throat> Written by both Isaiah and Ezekiel. They said those things because God told them to say those things. God prophesied those things through those men. How about the destruction of the city of Tyre? You might remember that from our study in Ezekiel chapter 26. That also being written around 600 B.C. It was in 332 B.C. that Alexander the Great completed the destruction begun by others. Each detail that was given in Ezekiel accurately fulfilled.
How about the four successive world kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome? Specifically prophesied in Daniel. That was written about 530 B.C. Each detail fulfilled by these empires rising and falling and the coming of the next great empire. There is no other book like this. How about the over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that detail Christ's birth, his death, his life, his resurrection? It is incalculable, the odds of all of those things being accurate and fulfilled by one person. One person. And there's over 300 of them. How about the, what's some other evidence we have that we can trust the Bible, that it did come from God, that it is, it is divinely protected, it is divinely inspired, it is divinely breathed out, and so therefore you can trust it as you trust God. How about the distribution and the indestructibility of the Bible? We talked about before how many people have tried to destroy the Bible and they are in the ground and the Bible stands and it will stand because what did God say? My word will remain forever. The Bible is the world's best-selling book. No other book is even close. Again, translated into thousands of languages. Various enemies try to destroy it. But Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Uh, I forget who, who coined this quote, but the Bible is a great anvil upon which many hammers have been broken. And that will always be the case. The fact that it has been so vehemently fought against and still remains makes you say, how is that even possible? How is it even possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. God is the one keeping it. He is the one who breathed it out, and he is the one who keeps his word, handing it down through generations to make sure that you and I have it too, so that we can read of him, see his holiness in its pages, find our sinfulness, and then read the story of redemption in and through Jesus Christ, learning of his mercy and his grace. Another thing that supports the Bible's claim as divinely inspired is archaeology. Many archaeologists use the Bible to find things. So not only is it a divinely inspired book talking about spiritual things, it's also an accurate history book. It's an accurate geography book. Numerous archaeological finds have supported the Bible's accuracy. Otherwise, unknown places and dates have been proven to be historically accurate. Nelson Gluck, a leading Jewish archaeologist, said, it can be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever disputed a biblical reference. Did you catch that? There has never been an archaeological discovery that disputes a biblical reference. It's the other way around. Every archaeological discovery proves biblical references. And that is what you would expect if the Bible truly is the Word of God. It would have to be held to the highest of standards and meet those standards, and it does. If it didn't, it would have been cast aside many, many years ago. It confirms the credibility of of those that God used to write it. God breathed it out and he used these different writers. It confirms their credibility. It confirms that they were writing with God's authority. How about this question? How do we know that we have what Moses, David, Jesus, and others really said and wrote? I mean, there weren't any Xerox machines back then. Uh, there was no such thing as Kinko's. So... That means the text that these authors wrote had to be recopied by hand. Can you imagine? I don't think we have the patience today to do this. I know I would have a difficult time doing that. And these copies would wear out and they would make more copies as those were needed. 
In the Old Testament, the Jewish people had scribes who were in charge of the manuscripts. They would meticulously go through them, counting words, paragraphs, letters, to know that they perfectly copied it. They believed it was the Word of God and was worthy of such meticulous handling. They even knew what the very middle letter was so that they could go to the middle letter of that particular portion of Scripture and count backwards and go to that middle letter of that particular point of Scripture and count forwards and make sure that they got the numbers they were supposed to get, counting every letter. I'm sure, I'm sure they would be amazed at Microsoft Word. <laughs> the oldest complete copy of the Hebrew Old Testament in museums today are dated to around 1000 AD. And that's a long time after the originals were written. The originals would have been written between 1450 and 400 BC. So one could question if after many centuries of copying, if we really have the original words. That is why, and you will probably remember the term Dead Sea Scrolls. That is why the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 was so helpful. Those well-preserved texts date back to 100 BC. And there is virtually 100% agreement between the scrolls they found in the Dead Sea Scroll Caves and those dated 1,100 years later. Did you catch that? 1,100 years between the manuscripts they had and what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they found almost a perfect match. Wow. Uh, 1947. That is amazing. That is impossible. This proves that we can trust the Hebrew copies of the Old Testament that are existing today. Yes? Virtually identical through all those years of copying. That is mind-blowing. What about the New Testament? We understand that about the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Well, the reliability of the New Testament Greek tests is even more certain than the Old Testament ones. If, if I blew your mind about the Old Testament... Well, just wait. Here's New Testament. The New Testament was written between 45 A.D. and 90, 95 A.D. Some fragments of the Greek text exist back to 120 A.D. or 150 A.D. And that's only 35 to 100 years after the originals that Paul, John, Luke, and others wrote. Another big help is that there are four to five thousand new testament greek manuscripts existing today i said four to five thousand not 45 four thousand to five thousand new testament greek manuscripts existing today by comparing those copies scholars can weed out any possible copying mistakes because there's so many to go from and reference Comparing factors of date and number and existing manuscripts and copies with other literature will show you just how accurate this is. Now, people who are not believers, who are skeptics of the Bible, um, if they went to college, they might take a class on the teachings of Plato. And all oh, the writings of Plato are, are absolutely true. We believe in them. They are, they are absolutely true. Um, Noteworthy, you can take it as history. You can take it as fact. Uh, what about Caesar's Gallic Wars? Well, you know, we, I, you can do a study, a military history study on that. And we believe these books with 100% historical accuracy. These are accurate. We put our faith in these things. You don't maybe talk that way about a book, but you'd say, do you believe that Plato's writing is, is accurate? Absolutely. Do you believe the Gallic, Caesar's Gallic Wars is accurate? Absolutely. Well, there is only, for Plato, only seven copies of the Man, oldest copies of the manuscript, there's only seven copies. How many did the New Testament have again? 4,000 to 5,000. What about Caesar's Gallic Wars? Ten copies. Ten copies. What was the New Testament again? 4,000 to 5,000 copies. By the way, the date of the oldest manuscript existing for Plato is 1,200 years later from its original writing. What did we say for, for the New Testament? 
uh, 35 to 100 years from its original writing? Do you see the hypocrisy? Oh, Caesar's Gallic Wars was 900 years after its original writing. So the earliest manuscript have that we have of Caesar's Gallic Wars, we have 10 copies of it, and it is from 900 years from the time of its original writing. For Plato, 1,200 years from its original writing and only seven copies of it. Aristotle, 1,400 years from original date, five copies. New Testament, 35 to 100 years from original writing, 4,000 to 5,000 copies of manuscript. Do you see? Just, just in that little bit alone. Far outweighs. It's not even close. It is not even close. It's as if God was saying, look, you want to trust in all the human writings and stuff. Kind of ties into what we were saying this morning about human wisdom. You want to trust in all the human writing stuff, just look at how much more so you should trust in mine. That is powerful. And yet, on college campuses all around the United States and in the Western world, people have no problem putting their faith in the writings of Aristotle, Caesar's Gallic Wars, Plato, and other works of ancient history, putting the seal of approval on it and putting all their weight behind it, saying, yes, this is accurate and true and historical fact when look at how much more evidence we have of the New Testament and look at how much closer to the original date of writing it is. 1,400 years, 1,200 years, 900 years, New Testament, 35, 35 to 100 years. How many manuscripts again? Oh, nine, oh, seven, oh, five. How many manuscripts are New Testament again? 4,000. To 5,000, it's not even close. It's not even close. So even if we were to use worldly standards, God's word still comes out on top and proves itself to be trustworthy. What about the question of does the Bible contradict itself? Well, I talk about this all the time, don't I? If, if you run into something that you think is a contradiction in the Bible, it is usually solved by context or it's solved by looking backwards to the original meaning of the words. Because there is no contradiction in the Bible. If you were to find a contradiction in the Bible, and God says, this is my word, I breathed it out, then you would have to say, God made a mistake. And does God make mistakes? No. So, the Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years by roughly 40 to 44 authors, three different continents, two different languages. The writers included Moses, an Egyptian-trained scholar, Joshua, a general and slave, King David and Solomon, a farmer, Amos was a farmer, fisherman, like Peter, tax collector, like Matthew, doctor, like Luke, rabbi, like Paul. All these different backgrounds and all the span of time, over 1,600 years for its writing, and yet... There is a singular message that is perfectly through the entire Bible. A present, it presents a consistent viewpoint and story of God's redemptive plan from beginning to end. In spite of all these different human authors that did the writing for the Lord as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, coming from all these different backgrounds, having different access to language and having different brain power, different writing styles, Yet, there is a singular focus and line throughout all of Scripture. Can you imagine if today we took 40 different writers from all these same kind of different backgrounds? Can you imagine them agreeing on anything? Let alone completely on every subject? Can you imagine them agreeing on even one thing? You ever play the game telephone? You whisper it, you know, hey, hey, hey uh, you know, uh, Tuesday sleeps at midnight, and so you t just pass it on, right? The next person, uh, you know, Ruby Tuesdays uh, is has half price apps at midnight. Pass it on. And the next thing you know, he gets to the end, and it's just like I like grapes. Like, it's not even the same thing. It's totally different, right? Can you imagine? That's what it would be like. But there is one author, God. 
That is why you can have this correlation. This is why you can have the consistency. And not just, not just kind of consistent, perfectly consistent. In all 66 books of the Bible, the Bible is self-consistent on significant issues. It doesn't avoid big issues. Where do we come from? Right? Why are we here? Where are we going? The big questions of life are addressed in the Bible, in Old Testament and New, and they fit together. They fit together. Where did we come from? We were created by God. Why are we here? To serve and glorify Him. Where are we going? Eternal life or eternal judgment? Critics allege that there are many discrepancies in the Bible, but the discrepancies that appear to them in particular, uh, details that can be generally explained in, in a couple different ways. There is uh, logical explanations. We talked about this um, earlier. Sometimes two contradicting statements are both actually true. When Matthew refers to one angel at Jesus' tomb and John describes two, there's no contradiction. Where there's two, there's one. Where there's two, there's one. Matthew wasn't counting. He just described what one of the angels said, right? So that's not a contradiction. But that is used all the time to say, oh, the Bible's just full of contradictions. Show me one. And usually when you say that to somebody, they'll be like, what? Well, show me one of the contradictions. Uh, right? And then let's say they're well-read and they do actually have one like this. Well, guess what? You can do what we just did. Like, well, that's actually not a contradiction. There are occasions where existing manuscripts, Greek or Hebrew, disagree on certain words or phrases. A few times when two books of the Bible record the same event, a number has been changed. It's not hard to imagine that some copies can have one or two minor issues. Somebody copying the manuscript by hand, not the original inspired author, can miscopy a number, a name, or insert a margin where there shouldn't be a margin. That does not mean that God's word is not divinely inspired. If I made an, if I made an error in translating God's word, it didn't mean, like, in, in I'm making a copy and I make an error, that doesn't put the error on God. And there is no major error. It's like a movement of a, of a piece or a place. Most of, the, most of these kind of interpretive challenges are going to be handled by context. Context or a look at the original meaning of the word, or just a close reading of the scripture. Sometimes critics allege that Jesus and Paul or Paul and James disagree on something like uh, faith and works. Oh, you've heard that, no doubt. I know some of you have. Well, Paul and James disagree on faith and works, but those are dubious claims. They are based on interpretation uh, failures of what a verse means. The burden of proof is on those who claim to see disagreement. Seemingly contradictory statements can be shown to harmonize well by understanding the context of how it was written. Context, context, context. 99.9% .9 of the problem is always context. We'll close tonight on this part of the series on how do we know the right books are in the Bible. Uh, and we'll go more in depth about this when we get to the the uh, how did we get the Bible that we have today and the different translations. But briefly, I want to touch on how do we know the right books are in the Bible? What, what, wasn't it just a group of guys hanging out with uh, big beards that decided what, Bibles, what books got in and what ones didn't? Well, yes and no. It was human councils that, uh, such as the one led by Athanasius in 367 AD, which listed the 27 books of our New Testament today. But they didn't determine which books were inspired. They merely recognized the supernatural character of those books. And there's a difference. This is supernatural character that those books already had. They didn't say, we give these books supernatural character. They just said, these books clearly have supernatural character. Some of these tests, uh, here's some of the tests that were used to conclude that a book or a letter was indeed uh, scripture. These are called tests of canonicity. Is it 
authoritative, meaning does it claim or exhibit God's authority? Does it say, thus says the Lord, for instance? That's a claim of authority. Is it authoritative? Does it claim that this is God speaking? Is it prophetic? Is it prophetic? Is it prophetic and, and is, it, is it something that has already happened that's shown to be true? Is it shown that this is not written by just a man? Is it authentic, meaning does it jive with what has already been revealed in God's word? So when these, when these councils would gather together, these are the questions they're asking. Is it authoritative? Is there a part in this book or this letter that says, thus says the Lord? Is it the Lord? Is it clearly stating that the Lord is speaking through this book or letter? Is it prophetic? Is it authentic? Does it jive with the rest of revealed truth that we know in the rest of the Bible, Old Testament and New? Is it dynamic? Does it show itself to be life-changing? Very similar to what we've already talked about, right? Is there supernatural change that happens? Because of this book or letter, is it dynamic? Does it show to be life-changing? And one of the most important tests of all, they're all important, but is it accepted by believers? Those who are absolutely guaranteed, like, look, some of us know people that we're not sure if they're believers or not, right? But we also know people that you know without a doubt are believers. The fruit is there. The life-changing uh, effect of the grace of God is there. The transforming effect of God's salvation is there. The regeneration is there. You know, everything is there. So you have no doubt that they're a believer. Do, tho do those such people receive that and say, this is truth. It resonates with me. When you and I do our Bible studies together or when I'm up here preaching and I'm teaching you what God's word means, and I tell you something and the light bulb goes off on, on a piece of, of scripture that you haven't had the light bulb go off on before. But it's almost like a tuning fork resonating, right? You're like, oh, yes. Yes, you know it's true. It resonates with you. That's what God's word does for believers because the Holy Spirit carried the writers of God's word along. And guess who indwells every genuine believer? that same Holy Spirit. So when a genuine believer hears the real, true Word of God rightly handled, it does something. It is received and it has an effect in them. That's one of the tests. Does this book, does this letter, does it, does it have that resonation in the hearts and minds of a genuine believer? Or does it not? What about this? How do you know if you're interpreting the Bible correctly? So many different groups claim to fi follow the Bible correctly. How do you know? It's used by cults, after all. You've got Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got Mormons, you've got others that are, use the Bible to try and prove uh, views of their own. They use it for legitimacy's sake. They'll never fully stand on the Bible. They, they just need a foot on the Bible so they can claim some form of legitimacy. All the while denying the genuineness of the Bible being the inspired, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. The real authority that cults have is some leader somewhere, some, some group of per persons or people somewhere and they always, they always consider those people's writing on the same equal authority as the Word of God. That's not right. You know that's not right. That's how you know someone's not interpreting the Bible correctly. Usually what happens in those circumstances too, those cults will leave parts of the Bible out because they can't have it there because it won't support their views. So now you have to say, well, we believe in the Bible, but we also believe that the Bible's been tampered with and it's been messed with, and so therefore you can't trust it. That's why we have our additional writings that are on the same level as the Bible. Don't worry about it. Just read it and do everything that it says. What, the Bible? No, 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 our writings. 
There are also liberal scholars who don't accept the authority and the inspiration of Scripture either. They might not be a part of the cult, but they don't, they don't affirm the superiority or the, the, the divine nature and authority of God's Word. They feel free to call the Bible wrong on issues that society uh, claims a different standard on. They take liberty to water down statements that they deem unacceptable. For instance, the seriousness of sin, the need to trust, trust Christ for salvation, Christ's um, exclusivity. He is the way, the truth, the life, only way to be saved. Well, they don't like that. So that's all wrong. Homosexuality is a sin. I don't like that. That's wrong. That part about God being love, yeah, I like that. Let's take that part and let's just push all our eggs into that basket. God is love, therefore, he likes me to be happy and wants me to do whatever it is I want to do. All the rest of that stuff, just forget about it. Conservative Bible scholars who take the Bible at face value arrive at the same interpretations on major issues. That's a good thing. Literal interpretation means take it as it was meant. All this is just to kind of prime the pump, to get you guys thinking, to get you starting to, like these are some of the issues that we deal with with the Bible. This is some of the reasons why you can believe that the Bible is trustworthy and true. There is a, a logical argument for the inspiration of God's word. It's what we started out with. It's what Charles Wesley proposed at the very beginning. That the Bible must be the invention of either good men and angels, bad men and demons, or it's literally of God. It's got to be one of those three things. And what did we say? We said it cannot be the invention of good men and angels because they wouldn't go about saying, thus says the Lord, because they would be lying they were, they're just giving what they, they wrote it, not God. So a good man or a good angel is not going to do that because they'd be lying, saying that God said this when it's really just their own invention. And we, we said that bad men and demons wouldn't write this because why would they write a book that commands to the forbidding of sin? Why would they write a book that commands duty and service and sacrifice for the glory of God? Why would they write a book that condemns themselves to hell for all eternity? They wouldn't. It's not them. And that leaves only one other option, that it is truly from God. It is divine in its inspiration, divine in its giving, divine in its protection, divine in every aspect of it. Next time we'll look at even more about the Bible, but for now, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the Bible. And uh, if it is your word, then we should pay attention to every single letter within it. And if it is your word, then we should be interested in it. If it is your word, then we should long to, to have knowledge and understanding and wisdom in it. If it is your word, we should live our lives by it, longing to please you. Lord, help us to have confidence in your word, a love for your word, a desire for your word, zeal for your word. Oh, help us to be people of the word. And thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.